From the station working for you, this is WRTV News at 530, streaming now. Now at 530, tracking the spread of COVID-19, the part of our body researchers are now pointing to as the primary source of the infection. And criminals busy overnight in Fishers. The alert tonight from police. Lindsay. Topping our lineup, questions are now being raised about the future of polling after discrepancies with this year's election results. What experts say could be in store. If it hasn't happened already from your kids or your grandkids, it probably will. Those difficult questions about the election. The advice from experts that's different this year. If you're still able to go out to restaurants, you may have noticed more tents as the weather cools down. But how do those spaces fare when it comes to protecting you from COVID? We're going to the experts for answers. First at 530 on a day when Indiana hit another record for new positive coronavirus cases, topping 4,000 for the first time. We are learning more about how the virus is spread. As Zach Dahlheimer from our Scripps station Norfolk shows you what researchers are learning from our mouse. It really is a first of its kind study. This year, Dr. Kevin Bird at UNC has been studying COVID-19, a disease that's impacted him personally. I lost two uh, in the summer uh, to, to this disease. He and others at UNC and the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research are behind a study showing the mouth is a robust site for infection and transmission of COVID-19. One of the things that we were hearing was reports that people were having a, a really symptoms in their mouth, unusual symptoms, loss of taste, uh, sometimes loss of smell or dry mouth. What we decided to do is go look at the glands that make spit or saliva and to look at the taste buds where really we, we have our, our main sense of taste and to see if those sites were being affected by the virus. Bird says a key thing they found is that the oral cavity can be broadly infected. So tongue, tonsils, glands. We found that the virus that sits in the saliva uh, actually correlates. The more of it you have, the more it correlates with the loss of, of taste and smell. What we found is there were some individuals that that might be their only symptom or a minimal symptom, and that could be indicative that you actually are infected by SARS-CoV-2. There were a number of individuals that either had uh, asymptomatic virus, you know, they're asymptomatic, but they have virus in their nose, or they're asymptomatic and they have virus in their saliva, and they're walking around and could infect others. Dr. Ryan Light says the study is a reminder of how wearing masks and social distancing can help you and others. Wearing a facial covering and wearing it appropriately to cover the nose and the mouth will decrease those droplet particles from being transmitted to other people, uh, which will decrease that asymptomatic spread when you don't know you have it. As for Bird, he believes the study could help answer questions in the fight against COVID-19. It gives us an idea of now how we can follow up to maybe even figure out why people are losing taste why that they have dry mouth and that was Zach Dahlheimer from our script station Norfolk reporting and coming up on the news at six another reminder of the symptoms of coronavirus versus the flu and where you can get tested Kevin and Amanda's staring at some clouds as we look north of Indy. These are mid to high level clouds that will continue to thin out. They will not produce any rain. We don't have any rain in the forecast till early next week. Let's talk temperatures then. It did impact the high temperature for today. We just missed 70. 65 is our current temperature. Wind out of the south at 9. Just want to show you the clouds on the satellite. That's the gray that you see, but northwest of Lafayette to Terre Haute, skies are beginning to clear. Just want to show you how quiet the country is. You have to go out into Washington and Oregon from Portland to around Seattle and Spokane, Washington to find showers there. And then the other edge of the country, Florida, down along the Carolina coast for us this evening. Our temperatures will be slow to drop, drop to uh, 45 by 7 a.m. Temperatures rebound tomorrow with a lot more sunshine on the way. We'll talk about some 70s, plural, coming up. Officials in Pennsylvania are stressing the importance of counting every single vote. As Maya Rodriguez tells us, in big cities and small towns across the state, people are coming together to make sure that happens. A simple message. Count every vote. Count every vote. Count every vote. For Kirsten Zolfo. And we believe that every vote needs to be counted. It's a personal one. I voted by mail-in, and I do that regularly anyway because I have uh, disability issues. Her mobility may be limited, but her voice and those of others in this crowd are not. Protect the results. Just 30 miles north of Philadelphia in the all-important suburbs and at the Bucks County, Pennsylvania elections office. We're also here to celebrate that we're outside of the place that the votes are being counted. 
It's an effort called Protect the Vote, pushing to make sure every vote in the state, no matter the party affiliation, gets counted. It's a completely nonpartisan effort. We just want to make sure that every vote gets counted. I mean, what could be more simple and what more American than that? But the Trump campaign is suing Pennsylvania on several legal fronts, hoping to block certain mail-in votes. Votes the Secretary of State says were legally cast by the millions here in the largest numbers ever seen in the state. The potential for multiple legal challenges in Pennsylvania looms large here, especially for ballots received after Election Day. By state law, those ballots can still be counted if they were postmarked on Election Day and are received by Friday. Those involved in Protect the Vote say they plan to rally here every afternoon this week. This is profoundly important. Because they say every vote is sacred. This is about American principles. In Doylestown, Pennsylvania, I'm Maya Rodriguez. Next in our lineup, questions are now being raised about the future of polling after discrepancies with this year's election results. What experts say could be in store. A crime watch alert tonight from Fisher's police after a series of vehicle thefts and break-ins overnight. Fisher's police responded to 12 thefts from vehicles and two reports of stolen vehicles early this morning. Most of the thefts occurred in the Stan Sandstone and Meadowbrook neighborhoods near 116th Street and Brook School Road. Detectives are asking residents in the area to look through their home security footage for any suspicious people on their property between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. If you have any info about these crimes, call the Fisher's Police Department. And Carmel police are asking for your help tracking down a person seen taking a backpack leaf blower from the bed of a pickup truck. This happened October 17th on the Brigade Circle. The suspect was driving an early 2000s Dodge Durango with a white rectangular decal on the back. If you have info that could help, call Carmel police. Many are scratching their heads right now trying to figure out why the polls have been so different from the election results we've seen so far. We saw this in 2016 too. But political scientists say there are a lot of different variables that play into it. First, response rates for polls have been declining. People who distrust the media and distrust corporations are less likely to answer polls. And right now, that's correlated with political support. Political scientists agree that door-to-door -door polling produces higher quality results. People who answer polls over the phone are less likely to admit who they're actually supporting. The electoral system is also different now that people no longer need to go to specific voting locations in their precinct. And this all makes it more difficult for pollsters to find the right proportion of voters to match what will likely happen on Election Day. Constructing the uh, likely electorate it's kind of like working with a recipe in which you have different ingredients, but you have to get the proportions right in order for the recipe to work. In the past two elections, pollsters have tried making changes in who they include. In 2016, there were more efforts to include people with different types of education, with an emphasis on people who have less than a college degree. In 2020, pollsters focused on different types of areas to get a feel for rural voting versus urban voting. In order to assess inaccuracies and make changes to future polls, pollsters must look at what they missed this year. One of the ways that we can always check if a poll is wrong is to compare it to the census. But the only way we know that our census data is good is if everybody completes the census data. The American Association of Public Opinion Research has created a task force that will look at the performance of 2020 polls. Results from that will come out just weeks after this election. More in our lineup. If it hasn't happened already from your kids or your grandkids, it probably will. Those difficult questions about the election. The advice from experts, that's different this year. For students, college can be a time of unparalleled change, but the pandemic has forced colleges to now change themselves. Some universities are cutting majors, others are cutting staff and tenured professors. Dan Grossman takes a look at the personal toll of these losses and what it means for the future. This is in a lot of ways, a career ending move. Four months ago, Susan Ramlo never thought she'd be here. I will tell you that everybody seemed to think that they were on the hit list as soon as they found out that it existed. Everybody I talked to. She figured her 26 years of tenure, her international recognition, her work ethic 
would ensure her job security. My exit interview took all of five minutes. Instead, she now sits in her home in Ohio as a former physics professor at the University of Akron, along with 96 others who were cut to save money back in July. I still had hope until the arbitrator's decision, and I pretty much cried for three days. The pandemic has exacerbated serious economic challenges some schools have been battling for years as birth rates in the country decline and higher education isn't as prioritized as it used to be. When COVID arrived, we chose to cancel our increase in tuition, room, and board that had a financial cost for us. Rock Jones is the president of Ohio Wesleyan University, a school that just cut 18 majors from its curriculum. He says in October, the university had to slash $7.5 million from its budget, a number that increased to more than $12 million, or a fifth of its operating budget once COVID hit. It's a big loss. It's a big loss. For David Treadwell, it is difficult to stomach. The journalism program is one that drew him to serve as the Ohio Wesleyan's Dean of Admissions in the 1970s. Knowing students will no longer get that education casts a grim picture, he says, for not only the profession, but the university's prospective base, as students might now look to transfer to pursue their majors elsewhere. The schools like Bowdoin, where I went, has a huge endowment. Harvard, those places, they can get by this. Schools that are very tuition dependent. They can't lose many students and really be hurting financially. Even those bigger universities are being affected. By one estimate, the pandemic has cost universities across the nation $120 billion. It's forced the University of Florida to take the first steps in furloughing some of its employees. And at the University of California, Berkeley, it's made them pause admissions into these three postgraduate programs, leaving kids who may have wanted to go there for years to look elsewhere for their postgraduate plans. Being alone, during this, and especially during a pandemic, would be so mentally taxing. Large changes that can be felt on a scale as small as one former professor who is now looking for where her life goes from here. I'm Dan Grossman reporting. The National Toy Hall of Fame is breaking barriers, inducting the first black baby doll to have an afro into its honorees for 2020. Sidewalk Chalk and Jenga were the other two that made it in. Baby Nancy exposed a long-standing demand for ethically correct black dolls. It's getting more convenient to listen to music while you exercise. Spotify will now stream directly from Apple Watches. No more needing to carry your phone with you. The Apple Watch was also recently upgraded so you can ask Siri to play music for you. Pandora can also stream directly on the Apple Watch. With President Trump and Joe Biden in such a tight race, many people are worried about the impact on the U.S. economy. But the Dow was up again today, more than 500 points. Consumer reporter John Matarese tells us why Wall Street isn't taking a big dip despite the ongoing uncertainty. The presidential race is still unresolved and might drag on in the courts for weeks. So why is the stock market going up and not plunging? To quote James Carville, elections are all about the economy, stupid. So a lot of voters have been worrying about their 401k accounts in the event of a hotly contested presidential race. With President Trump and Joe Biden in such a tight race, many people worried about a big market sell-off. But just the opposite happened the morning after. Why? CNBC says no matter the presidential winner, Congress appears to once again be split. Democrats controlling the House, Republicans controlling the Senate. That means there's little chance of major changes to health care or tax laws, since both houses have to approve it. So believe it or not, Wall Street is predicting status quo the next couple of years. Of course, presidents can issue executive orders, but the stock markets don't seem to expect dramatic changes. As always, don't waste your money. I'm John Matteris, WRTV. And I'm predicting status quo as far as our weather's concerned the next several days. The big change will come in the middle of next week. Temperatures for highs today right at 70 degrees along the Wabash River from Lafayette down through Covington, Vetersburg to Terre Haute. Otherwise, missing 70 degrees because of the cloud cover. We're at 65 in Indy right now. Coolest spot up in Miami County at 62. Otherwise, temperatures, as you can see, fairly uniform. Tomorrow, we're back to sunshine, and we're back in the 70s. What a way to end the work week. We can argue about mild or warm, however you want to describe it. 58's our average high. We'll obviously be well above that as you look at these temperatures with a southwest wind around 10 miles per hour. Next couple of days, this warmth will come without real strong winds. 
and that will make it even more enjoyable. Terre Haute, Bloomington at about 73. Saturday temperatures still in the low 70s, still lots of sunshine. Wind south at 5 miles per hour. As we move towards Sunday, that's when we'll see temperatures uh, change and uh, warm into the mid-70s. That's where we'll still be Monday, 75. Tuesday, a chance for some thunderstorms. A couple of those could be strong. Temperatures in the 70s on Tuesday. Then it's much cooler by Wednesday. Two days post-election, and the country is still in a situation of uncertainty. Yeah, it can be stressful for us adults, but experts remind us that we have to remember our kids are watching. I spoke with a child psychologist who tells me this year there are a few changes when it comes to advice to talking to your kids. This is a fraud. No one's going to take our democracy away from us. The divisiveness has gotten so significant, and we really can't help prevent our kids from getting exposed to it. For months before this polarized election, our children have seen attack ads, rallies, and protests. And with how divided our country is right now with this election, it's inevitable that they're going to see it. So child and adolescent psychologist Dr. Jessica Hawks says instead of trying to shield our children, we should be open and have age appropriate conversations. A lot of times parents worry that approaching these sensitive topics can somehow be unhelpful or maybe amplify the problem, but the opposite is true. Talking about it is really important. But it's not just talking with our children. We have to be mindful of the conversations we have with the other adults in our house. As parents, we just have to be really aware of how we're showing up every day in front of our kids to make sure that we're doing the things that we need to be doing to promote our kids health and well being. She says this is a great opportunity to teach our kids several lessons. One is how to be a critical thinker with not just what they see or hear, but this election cycle, what some children might read online. One of the things parents can be doing right now is teaching their kids how do you evaluate the information out there in a critical way, look to trusted news sources to be able to inform people's opinions. Another thing you can teach your kids is how to have differing viewpoints. It's important that kids learn how to stop, listen, ask questions and be open to other people's perspectives and be able to do that in a way that maybe at the end of that conversation, you don't change your opinion, but you have the ability to engage in that important political discourse in a respectful way. Especially in this election that split so closely down the middle. The American Psychological Association says the majority of both Republicans and Democrats have reported the election as a significant source of stress. A cognitive psychotherapist says a longer wait for results could lead to election stress disorder. When we're looking at anxiety, when we're looking at depression, the inability to concentrate, pervasive worry, depressed mood, unable to motivate, all of those symptoms that we see in anxiety and depression can be triggered by the unknowns and the stress of the election. She's been advising clients to focus on what they can control to ease stress. Try doing things that make you feel calm and grounded. We've talked at length about how car insurance companies are making record profits during the pandemic. Some offered rebates and relief, but those have mostly dried up. Now there's an indication everyone could be paying more soon. To be honest, there's no indication so far from insurers that they're going to lower rates in response to the pandemic. Data scientists with Insurify are predicting a 6% increase in auto rates in 2021. And that may be a hard pill to swallow for those driving less during the pandemic and experiencing financial hardships. And so I think it's logical that a lot of people might think about canceling their car insurance coverage as a way to save money, especially since they're driving less. But canceling is not the route you want to take. Depending on where you live, just going two months without would likely end up costing you $180 on average more. That includes having your driver's license reinstated and higher insurance rates. But you could reduce your full coverage policy, or if you have multiple cars, look into a car storage insurance. Shopping different policies with different companies is always recommended. Now, there are laws that vary by state on how much profits auto insurance companies can make. So if you think you're being unfairly priced, you can contact your state insurance commissioner or representative. Finally, in our lineup, if you're still able to go out to restaurants, you may have noticed more tents as the weather starts to cool down. But how do those spaces fare when it comes to protecting you from COVID? 
We're going to the experts for answers. We're seeing even more tents outside of restaurants as the weather starts to get a little colder. But just how safe are they for protecting you against COVID? Lindsay Marr, an environmental engineer who studies how viruses circulate, says with the single tents that hold one table, you need to consider who you're eating with. You'll be isolated from other diners, which is good, but you'll be isolated from other diners, which can be bad if you're sitting with someone else who happens to be infected. So if you're doing a single tent, the best situation is to do it with people in your own household or your own pod. She says she wouldn't go inside one of these personal tents right after the group before you leaves. The amount of time you need in between depends on how well the tent is ventilated. If it's really pretty closed up, I would probably want to give it 20, 30 minutes. But if they can open the door or maybe it has some kind of windows to it or shake it around, um, then you know five or 10 minutes should be plenty for the air to kind of move through there. As for the bigger outdoor tents where you can have multiple tables, she says the ventilation for them is better than being inside, but not quite as good as if you weren't in a tent at all. You want to make sure the tables are spaced out so the closest people are 10 feet apart or more, and also make sure people are wearing their masks when they're not eating. Well, we're not just seeing more tents, but different types of tents too. You can see businesses are getting creative. Tomorrow, how restaurants are hoping this innovation keeps them afloat through winter. Temperatures in the 40s, that's the way we'll start your Friday. 65 by noon, we'll talk about how the afternoon warms up again and pushing records for the weekend. All those details are straight ahead. That's all for the news at 530. The news continues right now.